Although the dictionary definition of the desert biome says, quote, an arid sandy region, normally deficient in rainfall or natural moisture, unquote, we've decided to put it in our own words to make it easier to understand. We think it's a sandy area with little precipitation with mainly nocturnal animals. Now let's introduce you to some of the organisms that have homes in the desert. Now let's start with the plants. The first plant we'd like to talk about is the dog band. A cool thing about the dog band is that when the plant gets injured, it can heal itself. It seeps out a milky latex that heals the plant. The latex is a poison and when animals eat it, they die. The dog band is useful because it can be used for medicine for fever, indigestion, and stomach worms. And now for the interactions with other organisms. It poisons, leaves, kill animals when eaten. The next plant we'd like to mention is the brittle bush. It's got hairy leaves which protect it from the sun. This plant is useful because its stems can be made into gum, glue, incense, and medicine. It's fairly tall, so it dominates over most other plants. And finally, the last plant we'd like to talk about is the jumping kala. This is a very interesting plant. Some cool adaptations are if you get moderately close to it, it will shoot silvery spines at you. Also, segments of the plant will fall off and grow another one. Plus, its thick layer of spines protect it from the heat. We could lie and say that it was useful, but well, let's just come straight and say simply it's a pest. It sucks up a lot more water than most other plants, and it takes up a lot of space. Plus, it's at least three to seven feet tall. Now we'd like to introduce you to the animals of the desert, their adaptations, usefulness, interactions with other organisms, and now it's Sam's turn to speak with us about the desert bighorn sheep. The desert bighorn sheep has huge horns spread out from its head. It also has a lot of fur, which would make you think logically that it would be hot, but that fur protects it from the sun and keeps it warm at night. A couple interactions with other animals are, it's a herbivore, and sometimes they will fight over ladies and their horns will collide. This animal is useful because it controls the number of plants, which is crucial because there is a shortage of water in the desert biome. Next, we'd like to inform you of the kangaroo rat. It has humongous eyes, which help it to see at a wider range. It's able to kick sand at other animals to see if they're alive. It has a pouch in its mouth, which can hold food for weeks while it tries to find shelter. And it has a huge fluffy tail that helps it balance and steer its way around. It's useful because it controls the amount of insects and plant population. Its interactions are that it's an herbivore and once again it controls the plant and insect population. Now we'd like to talk about one of my favorite animals, the sidewinder. I like this animal because of its cool adaptations. For instance, it got a tannish, pinkish, grayish color. It's got eyes on either side of its head, which obviously help it see predators on its left or right. Also, it puts venom on the ground, which drives other animals away. It's useful because its venom is useful in various snake-bite cures. Its interactions with other organisms are that it bites other animals and kills them. My favorite desert animal is the thorny devil. When it feels threatened, it rolls up in a ball and its spiky body rolls toward the animal. It is similar to a chameleon in that it will change from reddish to tannish depending on the color of the soil it is walking on. Like the jumping cola, this animal is not useful. It's a pest. Also, it interacts by eating ants. The next animal we'd like to introduce you to is the javelina. It has a strong nose and it hunts in groups. It interacts by eating plants. It's useful because it helps with the water shortage in the desert. The map above shows the areas on Earth where there are deserts located. Most deserts lie in the rain shadow. A rain shadow is when the winds push up one side of the mountain, causing it to pour on top of the peak, thus leaving the other side dry because there's no more rain left to fall. Now you've learned of some of the organisms that live in the desert, but not the climate, what eats what, symbiotic relationships, abiotic and biotic factors, and so on. How about we start with the climate? The average temperature overall is over 64 degrees Fahrenheit. It usually gets around only one inch of rain per year. The food web is a diagram showing how energy passes from organism to organism. Most food webs show interconnections like this one. This particular food web has the sun going to the wildflowers and the Wawitzia flower, down to the camel, and the wildflowers down to the kangaroo rat. The kangaroo rat down to the javelina and the sidewinder. The camel to the turkey vulture and the camel spider. The arrow goes from the organism that gets eaten to the organism that's eating it because it's giving its energy to the bigger predator.
Parasitism, when two organisms interact and one gets harmed. An example of parasitism is the camel spider. The camel spider burrows into the camel, lays its eggs, and when they hatch, they eat their way out, which kills the camel. Commensalism, when two organisms interact and one benefits, but the other is not harmed. An example of this is when the bobcat lays in the shade of a tree, the tree doesn't get harmed and the bobcat stays out of the heat. As we said before, the dog vein seems out a milky latex, but when it hardens, it blocks out the sun, which will make the leaf fall off. That's where the dog vein beetle comes in. This beetle eats the hardened latex, which allows the sun against the plant. It also gives the beetle something to eat. The next topic we'd like to discuss is how abiotic factors affect biotic factors. Most of you know that abiotic factors, say sand, are things that were never alive, and that biotic factors, say a thorny devil lizard, are things that are alive or were once alive. One example of how abiotic factors affect biotic factors is like how the sun affects a cactus or how sand affects an animal. For instance, the sun affects the cactus by providing the third step in photosynthesis, sunlight. If you took the sun away, the cactus or any other plant couldn't survive. The sand is extremely hot during the day, courtesy of the sun, and because the animals have already adapted to the hot sand with padded feet, if you took out the sand, their padded feet wouldn't be of any use. The ground is very hot because the sun beats down on it directly overhead. The sun is important to every biome. This is how the sun is important to the desert. All life starts with the sun. Namely, the sun gives energy to the plants, which give energy to animals and so on. Some of the things that are affecting the desert are large cities like Los Angeles, which are spreading throughout the desert. Military bases are moving in and farms are developing along the Colorado River. Some of the off-road vehicles are ruining the desert, churning up sand and destroying shallow root systems. Wells in agriculture are making the underground water tables drop to very low levels. We humans have been turning the land into tourist attractions. The parks have spread for miles, taking up the land that belongs to the wildlife. Then the animals are pushed from their natural habitat. Ranches are also taking up the land. Luckily, in spite of all we are doing, half of the desert remains in its original condition, but we still need to save this biome. As you may be able to see, the desert is an interesting place with interesting organisms. We've talked about a variety of animals and plants and the abiotic factors that live in the desert. We hope you've found our documentary on the desert interesting.